So in respect of this question, we've got three parts to it. Let's break it down into its components. Attempt it slice by slice, bit by bit, chunk by chunk, whatever you want to say. So we start off with our IAS 39. Our IAS 39 impairment rules. I'll scribble down somewhere. I'm sure I'd written this down somewhere. First of all, there must be evidence. Of the impairment before an impairment review takes place. And the reason for this is simply to cut back on the costs for the company. You don't want the company incurring huge expenses every year having to imp going through an impairment test for every single asset. So the first thing we say, well, if there's no evidence, then you don't need to do go through the, the exercise. Examples would be late payments, bankruptcy. It's always a good clue that something's not worth quite what you thought it was. Um, public financial problems. So if you bought some sovereign debt from Italy, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, Greece, France, Bulgaria, Hungary, you name it, it's going to be it very, very soon. Coming to a country near you, there has been public evidence of financial problems. Secondly, we only impair for historic or past events. This approach is criticised as being imprudent. So if you believe a company is going to a future problems because you think something is going to happen in a particular market, you can't do it. Unless the events have got to have already taken place. There's got to be some evidence. Cash flows Cash flows must be reliably measured. So we must have evidence that we can generate cash flows from somewhere. And in respect of the two measurement models, If we're using amortized cost, 
you take your carrying amount per the SFP and you take away from that what we refer to as the recoverable amount which is the present value of the cash flows discounted at the original discount rate. And that gives us our impairment. Now, if you're going to use the fair value model, think about this very carefully. If you're using a fair value model to measure financial instruments, what are you automatically doing at each SFP date? You're revaluing them. So the impairment is automatic. when the fair value is calculated. So that's part A1. And I'm looking there, have I got roughly six points? And roughly, I have. So at the back of my mind, all times, a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of inspired guesswork. Part A2 is the Bromwich loan. It says the effective and stated interest of this loan was 8%. Interest is payable by Bromwich at the end of each year and the loan is repayable on the 30th of November. So the amortised cost model is used to measure this loan because firstly the intention was to collect cash flows so that's our business model test until maturity and cash flows on specific dates are due. So we're supposed to receive interest each year and the loan is repayable on the 30th of June 20x7. So always apply those two tests. If you satisfy both of those tests, you use the amortized cost model. The directors of Ambush have heard that Bromwich is in financial difficulties and is undergoing a reorganisation. The reorganisation is evidence that an impairment is needed. The directors feel that they will only receive $100,000 on the 30th of June X7 and no future interest payments. So our carrying amount that 
the value of the loan in the statement of financial position before impairment is 200,000. We compare that to our recoverable amount, which is going to be 100,000. We're not going to receive any interest. And we're going to discount that by 8% for two years, which means that our recoverable amount is 85734. So this is going to be our revised SFP figure, and therefore our impairment is 114266. And this is the amount that you would debit to the income statement. No, because we're at 2005. So that's the position we're at now. So what's happened between 2003 and 2005 is irrelevant, unless there'd been an impairment in those earlier years. So that's part A. Part B, I felt, was a bit strange. Um, the impairment of trade receivables has been calculated using a formulaic approach which is based on a specific percentage of the portfolio of trade receivables. So if we take a look at the issue of our receivables, general provisions should not be used per IAS 39. Instead, we should look at the expected cash flows from each risk category of debt. So therefore, you, it's effectively saying we need some form of aged debtors analysis or aged receivables analysis, and we can apply principles to that. So let's take a look at the receivables of Ambush. So the first one that we see is Trey. And it says that Trey has come to an arrangement with Ambush whereby the amount due of 4 million will be paid on the 30th of November X6 together with a penalty of 100,000. So what Ambush has done is that although it's owed 4 million, it's put a receivable of 4.1 million in its statement of financial position. But it's ignoring the fact that that money is not going to be received for a year. So the cash flow should be discounted and it says use a discount rate at 5%. By 5% for one year, so that's 4.1 million. We're going to receive the money in a year. That gives us a figure of 3905. 
Next, we come to milk. And it says milk has a similar credit risk to the other receivables. So milk, although this is a material debt, It should be treated identically to other receivables. Next word, because it has the same risk profile. And also, we're expecting the money to be received on the same date. Therefore, our expected cash flow is going to be 2 million for milk plus 4.6 million for the others. Now, some people say, well, should we discount for two months? I would probably say no, because it's too, it's too messy. And also, unless you've got a very good calculator, you're going to struggle to do it for, for two months anyway. So two months is standard credit terms. You wouldn't normally discount trade creditors or trade, trade receivables. If it's a period of a year, there's a case for doing it. So our total receivables is 3905 plus 6.6 6 million. Equals 10505 Therefore, ambush should reduce the allowance for receivables from $520,000 to $495,000. Where do I get that figure from? It's our carrying amount less our revised figure for receivables. So try to use as much information from the question as possible. It says the company uh, in respect to buildings uses the revaluation model. Buildings originally cost 10 million, had a useful life of 20 years. So our original depreciation it's 10 million over 20 years. It's $500,000 a year. So the carrying amount at the 30th of November X4 
would have been 9.5 million. And it says on the 30th of November X4, the buildings were revalued downwards to 8 million. So our downward revaluation is 8 million. So the double entry is credit PPE 1.5 million. What do you debit for a downward revaluation? Income statements. Depreciation 20x4 onwards. So date by date, step by step approach. What's it going to be? It's going to be 8 million. We've still got 19 years remaining. So that gives us a figure of 421,000 a year. So our carrying amount at the 30th of November X5, it's going to be the asset original value of 8 million so the figure at end of X4, less 421,000 it's 7.579 million at the 30th 11th X5 we revalue upwards to 11 million so that's going to be debit PPE 11 million whoops 